everyone, and welcome back to the closing sessions of the day. Again, we have like six or seven seats over here, so all of you guys that are standing there, just kind of move on right here. How many of you guys enjoyed the breakout sessions? Yeah. Cool. How many of you guys got your professional photo taken? That was a long line. I couldn't stand in that line. So I know I talked to a bunch of you during the last few hours, and you all sounded really excited about the opportunities and networking. I also talked to the employers, and it sounds like a lot of you guys were very well suited to a lot of jobs that they have open, which is awesome. My funniest story, though, is, of course, from Rakuten. So it turns out that a lot of people went to the Rakuten Center and basically thought they were the VC company Rakuten. So Rakuten, unfortunately, had to write on my beautiful created table for them, no VC investment pitches, exclamation, exclamation, no minority investments, no elevator pitches, and then we are hiring nano degree graduates circled. <laughs> So I am going to put this up on the app so you guys can all look at it, but I had to take a photo of it on my phone. Um, so with that, let me introduce to you our most inspirational panel for the day, which is technology and social good. And with us today, we have Brian Pinkerton of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Matt Merrifield of the Nature Conservancy, and Jennifer Dulski of Change.org, moderated by our very own Stuart Fry. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hello. What a day. It's been a really exciting day, but I think, uh, in my biased opinion, you're in for the best part of the day, um, where we're going to have an, a really, truly inspirational conversation around uh, how to leverage technology to create positive social impact. And I don't think we could have a more qualified or better panel up here. Um, Shanaz just introduced them, but um, I'd like to just, just point out that we've got um, everything from education uh, and science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, uh, environment and nature uh, at the Nature Conservancy, and global issues of all kinds at uh, uh, change.org. So we've got a broad spectrum of perspectives that are coming into this conversation today, um, and I'm really excited to be a part of moderating it. The first, the first issue I wanted to kind of look at is technology as a tool. Um, you know, like, like many tools, it could be used to do really powerful good things or not so good things. And um, I don't know how many of you know this, but 23 years ago, Brian built the first internet search engine called Webcrawler. So as he built this new tool for an emerging technology, Brian, I'd, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on how you thought it might impact society uh, for better or worse. Well, you know, as, as most things, uh, there was very little thought about the bigger implications right out of the gate. But, um, you know, at, at first it was just a tool for me to make more efficient use of my time and, and be able to find things. Um, but it was pretty clear within a few months that it was an essential part of the Internet, right? Like being able to find information quickly uh, without following link after link after link was, was really like the thing that made the Internet useful. Um, and... I think it was, you know, it was maybe six months in where I realized, like, hey, this is, like, a big deal for everybody, right? The internet, like, in sort of 92, 93, the internet was really largely an academic thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was very little commercial use, and there was very little sort of general knowledge use. Um, but that changed, like, within a year. Right. And, <laughs> wow, um, it was... Uh, it was clear that it was going to be, you know, it was going to encompass information for everybody and that it was going to make the ordinary information that you and I take for granted available to anybody anywhere on the planet. Yep. Um, and that was going to make a big difference. Very cool. Thank you. And so, Jennifer, I, I kind of want to look at that same question from the lens of change.org as a platform where anyone in the world can uh, create a petition about an issue they care about and generate massive awareness and support for that. Um, how do you and your team think about tools, processes, um, and just a general philosophy to make sure um, that the change that's being created is trending in the 
on the long the right arc. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on how you view that. Our belief is that change really only happens if you have all voices participating in the conversation. So our view is that it's not actually up to us to have opinions about what's good and what's bad, but rather to be an open platform and to encourage the voices of regular people all around the world to speak up about what matters to them. And you know, now we see more than 1,000 petitions start a day. We have one victory almost every hour. So people are really mobilizing others around them at a pace that's faster than ever before. And it's hard to keep up with that <laughs> as a platform, similar to the way that YouTube or Facebook or anyone else um, has a lot of content coming in. We depend on our users to help us see which content is acceptable and which is not. And what we do is we have you know, community guidelines that say we don't allow hate speech, we don't allow bullying or defamation or inciting violence, but after that, everything is open. And we do, we see petitions on both sides of pretty much every issue. And in the world we're living in today, which is really more polarized than I think we've all seen in a long time, I think platforms like ours have an opportunity to play a role in starting to build the bridges because we do have people expressing all kinds of opinions. And one thing that's actually surprised me recently is looking at the data and it turns out we have more in common than we think. So I think some people think that if you sign a gun, you know, a pro-gun rights petition that you would automatically sign anti-LGBT campaigns. But it's definitely not true. Like people sign different campaigns on different issues and there's more commonality between them than one might expect. That's fascinating. Uh, speaking of the, um, the, the sharing of information and empowering of causes, Matt, one of the, one of the things that I read an uh, interview you did is a big part of your job you consider is the is democratizing information uh, and access to that information um, it, as it relates to conservancies and policies uh, that you care about. Um, one of the specific ways you're doing that, and I'd love to hear you talk more about it, is a tool you built called eCatch. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what that is and how specifically that technology is helping. Uh, Sure, yeah. So a lot of the problems that we face in conservation and environment is that the, uh, the data systems tend to be very old and haven't really kept pace with innovation and technology, and so they tend to be paper-based and whatnot. And so the idea behind eCatch was just that everybody carries a phone and has some sort of mobile, mobile handset and that we ought to be capturing this information digitally to begin with. And this, in this particular case, we were talking about fishermen that the Conservancy was working with here in California. Um, so there was, it's, we oftentimes talk a lot about the, the mobile aspect of that and that that's a really interesting you know, application and you've got you know, fishermen using this, but the sort of add-on benefit of getting that data was really where we saw um, a whole bunch of interesting things. So um, all of a sudden when um, these fishermen had access to their own information that they typically were just writing down on paper and mailing off to whatever management agency, now that they had it, they could start to actually do collective decision making that was it was just not possible before. So it was kind of a little bit of like a money ball situation where they had this kind of collective knowledge about what they were doing and, and that enabled them to do things that, you know, really in, in our business, the kind of holy grail in, in, in oceans protection is to have a marine protected area. That's typically a very contentious process and um, often, you know, has winners and losers. In this particular example, working with fishermen, they were able to actually collaborate and create what I'd call you know, voluntary marine protected areas and do it in a way that didn't require any government intervention and it was really solely driven by data. And um, that's really the sweet spot for us is, is um, sort of democratizing the collection of that information and, yep. and utilizing it for these types of decisions. So how does a project like eCatch get funded? And more broadly, how does the funding landscape for social impact initiatives compare or contrast to other <laughs> ventures you might be familiar with. Like it feels like it's a very unique challenge that um, some social impact organizations have to solve. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, all of our funding is from foundations. It's soft, it's very lumpy, it's uneven. And it just makes a real challenge to get enough, you know, what I'd call, you know, runway to, to really do these projects right initially. And so um, it is a constant struggle. We try to create funds internally at the Nature Conservancy that, that we can have that amount of runway, but it's, um, it's, you're continually selling and, and, um, and, and oftentimes the return is, is about impact. It's not about dollars made. And so that's a different set of metrics that you have to show. 
Brian, I, I wonder if you can weigh in there um, thinking about what, what does return mean to Chan Zuckerberg Initiative? And I know that may vary on a case-by-case -case basis, but, or more importantly, what does it mean to you and the work you do on the technical team? Yeah, I think it's, it's something that we're struggling with constantly. Um, and I think, you know, being sort of typical technology people, um, we look at, you know, we're very, we're very quality or quantitative about this. We want, we want to know what our return is, either, you know, through in whatever metric we choose, right? Whether it's the people we reach, the engagement we have, the impact we make, um, and we really want to know that, right? That's how we all run our regular businesses, and there's no different, there's, you know, there's no reason to suggest that um, these other efforts should be any different, right? Um, and, but, you know, some of them are very diffi difficult to quantify. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, we're taking an evolutionary approach to this. We measure what we can measure. We strive to improve those metrics. Uh, we're constantly on the hunt for metrics that we can measure that give us a better idea of what the impact is. Um, and, uh, you know, we just, we're learning constantly in this way. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I want to extend this idea on re return on investment um, in this space a little bit further to uh, address this notion. I've heard, in very, I've heard it articulated in various ways, but uh, people don't tackle social impact problems or entrepreneurs don't start um, social organizations because the risk-reward ratio isn't as attractive as it might be for in other areas. And as three very talented, highly accomplished people have chosen to invest the most valuable thing you have, your time, into um, social impact or social oriented organizations. Um, I wonder how you'd address that, that yeah. sentiment that it, it's too hard or there's not enough return on social impact for people out in our audience today who might be thinking about using the skills they're learning for good. Yeah, I mean, I'd start by saying it's just increasingly untrue that that's the case. Yeah. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that there is a new class of companies called Benefit Corps, which is what Change.org is. Many people think we're a nonprofit, but we're actually a social good company. So yep. it is actually possible to be both financially successful and drive massive impact in the world. And, you know, with stats that you see now, like the last report from Edelman, the you know, big PR agency says 86% of millennials demand to work in a place that has purpose and meaning. Like, it is just true that the companies that do good for the world will actually be the most successful. The economic incentives are shifting, and we see this all the time at Change because companies have customers that demand of them to do good in the world, and we see that play out on our platform. So. You know, you look at companies like Tom's or Method or Patagonia, they're successful not in spite of doing good, but because Cause. they do good yep. in the world. Yeah. So do, uh, do well by doing good. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts on that question? Advice? I think there are emerging good models for this. Yeah. Um, like Jennifer said. Um, and I think even on a lot of for profit companies, there are, you know, not if the entire company is focused on this, but there are arms and pockets of people that are pursuing good, uh, whether it's working on open source, working on projects for the community. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunity and what matters is your initiative in sort of discovering these projects and driving them um, and then sort of convincing your employer that you, you know, Half of your day job should be working on this other thing. Yeah. Um, super valuable. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so I, I recently convinced my employer that we should be working a lot harder on scholarships, which is why we've been able to <laughs> 4x the number of scholarships we awarded in the last year. Um, but I, I totally agree that there are ways to identify opportunities to do good that can be part of your day job uh, and create a positive benefit for both your company and your customers. Um, so as we look to the future, um, I, you know, I think that one of the, well, there's been a lot of exciting talk around AI, robotics, machine learning, um, virtual reality, and, and I'm curious as you think about what's around the corner, Matt, I'm gonna ask you to start with this, but like, especially in your world, what are some of the emerging technologies you're most excited about that are gonna have a positive impact on your conservancy efforts? 
Yeah, I think I'm, I'm very excited about AI and, and machine learning. And I think when, you know, using the eCatch example, we had a situation where it's a very active, uh, you know, environment to uh, ask someone to record what it is that they're catching. And um, going forward, you know, you can imagine a future whereby um, a, a fishing vessel is a lot like an autonomous vehicle with a, outfitted with a bunch of sensors like cameras, yeah. GPS, uh, whatnot, and that you're really, you know, applying a whole bunch of uh, machine learning to make sense of that. And uh, right now we have a contest going with Kaggle where we're asking people to look through um, videography that comes off of vessels to see if they can actually identify what species are being caught. And really with the aim That's of cool. kind of getting to impact, you know, getting to, you know, 100x improvement on the review time because we've got situations where people are spending six hours reviewing a 10-hour fishing trip. And so we really think we can winnow that down. And that right now is the barrier to scale in the industry. So the concept of AI being applied there and to just general environmental monitoring overall is, is pretty exciting to me because we're, we sort of have a pretty deep amount of information that could benefit from some pattern recognition. Awesome. Very cool. <clears throat> Any other technologies, Jennifer? Yeah. I mean, I think certainly that AI and machine learning has relevance to us as well. Part of the challenge we face, like many large platforms, is there's just so much content and how do you get the right, most relevant content to the people who will find it most you know, relevant and interesting. At this point, we add a million new users a week, and so being able to understand them as rapidly as we can and get them the right information is helpful. The other thing that's exciting to me is um, in the area of video and also VR, like really at the end of the day, we're a storytelling platform, yeah. and we have some of the most incredible stories on earth, like people who end up changing laws on sexual assault and bullying and ending acid attacks in India and all these things they do because of their stories. And I am embarrassed to admit we now have them telling those stories with like a single image and a block of text, which is just insane. And so when I look at all the technology that's out there for bringing people's stories to life in a, in a more robust, compelling way, I'm, I'm excited about yeah, that. Yeah, very cool. Nice. I might be the Luddite in the bunch here and, uh, <laughs> and just say math and statistics. Uh, <laughs> because the fact is that, like, as talking about, there are many, if you want a particular outcome, you're much more likely to get that in your st statistics. Um, so actually having a thorough, thorough grounding in mathematics and statistics and really being rigorous about your data is perhaps the most important thing we can imagine. in this information economy. Awesome. We, we also have math and statistics classes at Udacity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so <clears throat> one of the things that um, uh, I think I wanted to explore is this notion that um, um, with the individual stories, picking up on this notion that, you know, you have a year ago, Jennifer, you wrote, a year ago today actually, for Women's Day, you wrote a blog post about um, six women that are challenging the status quo. Um, and, and what I want to pick up on is this notion that it is about individual actions, it's about individual stories, um, and it's about the um, first step that you take, whether it's convincing your employer that you could take on this project. So I wonder if we could, um, if I could ask Jennifer you to start with one story, whether it's from a petition or a personal experience, or even your own, uh, that, that you could share with us as inspiration to kind of take that first step to use technology for social good. Sorry, a, f a story that talks about why someone uses technology for social good? Yeah, or just or, or an individual instance um, of uh, a, one person taking a first step. Yeah. First of all, that's why I have my red shoes on for International Women's Day. So. <laughs> I didn't strike today, though, <laughs> so, um, and I'm glad that the women in the room are, are also here, but um, yeah, I mean, I, this is just so true. We see it every single day that regular people who seem like the people in the world who have the least power are actually the most powerful people, and the way that they gain power is that they are willing to share their stories. And so the, the story I'll tell is a, um, about a young woman who uh, is a Harvard, she was a Harvard student, she's in her early 20s, um, 
incredible woman named Amanda Nguyen, and she actually she went to Harvard to study national security and astrophysics, um, and was working at NASA, wanting to go to Mars. Uh, but when she was a student at Harvard, she was raped, and mm. she went to her local rape crisis center, and she learned that in order to protect herself, to, to take care of the evidence and preserve it from her rape kit, that she, in the state of Massachusetts, they only preserve rape kits for six months. I don't know if you can imagine any other type of crime, like imagine a murder case where they would throw away the evidence after six months. It's crazy. And the statute of limitations on a rape is 15 years. But she would have to literally go to the state of Massachusetts every six months, file crazy paperwork just to make sure that they don't throw her evidence away. And most people would get frustrated by that and, and be really upset, but maybe do nothing about it. And instead of doing nothing, she did one thing. She started with one really courageous thing, which was sending an email to everyone she knew. Right. And she said, I want to do something about this. Would you be willing to help me? Here's what happened. And everybody came out to support her. The, the crux here is like the more vulnerable you're willing to be with your own story, the more people rally behind you. And she got lawyers and engineers and comedians and all sorts of people to come out and help her. And the next step she took was starting a petition on change.org and 150,000 people signed it. And she ended up with this group of volunteers finding all these other survivors on change.org and raising money to fly them to Washington. They met with members of Congress. And this 25-year-old woman got the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights passed into law last year unanimously by the United States Congress. <laughs> it is, yeah. And now she's, so she's not done yet. She's passed six laws, Congress and five states. She wants to do all 50 states, and she says she's giving herself two years, and then she's going to go back to NASA. <laughs> so really just amazing what a single step can Absolutely. Do. And on behalf of all the causes in education and science, environment and nature, and all the causes that change.org touches, I want to personally thank you, and on behalf of everybody here, thank you for taking your own first step into creating positive social change for us and being leaders that we can admire and look up to. Uh, and I would also like to uh, encourage all of you to think about how the skills you learn, the communities you build, um, and the technologies you're studying can be used to make this world a little bit better place. Um, and we'd be proud to be part of that as Udacity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so next, um, it's my honor to reintroduce Dr. Ashwin Ram, who is with Amazon Alexa, um, leading a number of AI initiatives, but really specifically focusing on some awesome stuff around conversational AI. Um, you met Dr. Ram earlier today on a panel, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to reintroduce him here today uh, for his keynote. Hi again. So I'm Ashwin Ram. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about conversational AI. You, you've probably all seen quotes like this, the age of touch is at the end, uh, something new is on, this, on the horizon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you look at where we've come in the computer land, for decades, we've been typing at our computers. That's the primary mode of interacting with the computer. For the last 10 or so years, we've been touching and swipe the smartphone changer. Now, I'll share with you what we did and what the game changer has been. So the vision behind Alexa is, is really this, that when we communicate with technology nowadays, we have to learn the technology. We learn user interfaces, we press buttons and dials and all of that stuff. But why don't we have machines learn about us instead of the other way around? So if I'm talking to you, if I want to communicate with you, I'm not typing at you, I'm not touching and swiping and turning dials, I'm just talking. Let's do that with our machines as well. So that's where Alexa comes in. 
right? In fact, I brought Alexa with me. I'll have her, assuming the Wi-Fi works in here, let's have her introduce herself. Alexa, introduce yourself. I'm Alexa, and I'm designed around your voice. I can provide information, music, news, weather, and more. So that's Alexa. Uh, she comes in this form factor. She also comes in an echo, the little things you've seen recently, the dots uh, on tablets, on your television. And I'll show you increasingly other kinds of devices. The magic that made Alexa possible was, the, uh, was this far field voice recognition technology. So Alexa sits in your house. It's not in your phone, right? It's not in your computer. It's just sitting out there in your house and you talk to it naturally across the room like you would talk to any person. And there might be other people in the room, there's music playing, or maybe your oven's going off, or uh, there's conversations going around. It doesn't matter, Alexa picks up your voice and talks with you. And that's the far field technology that we invented. What does Alexa do? Pretty much about everything. Uh, initially, there was a lot of emphasis on music and shopping, as you would expect from Amazon. Uh, so Alexa would play music, not just from Amazon, from Pandora, Spotify, TuneIn, really whatever you like. Uh, elect, a lot of people use Alexa for household organization, shopping lists, timers, alarms, calendars, those kinds of things. Alexa gives you information, news, weather. Uh, you can ask it any question, pretty much, and she will have an answer for you. A lot of you sit around smart homes. Alexa will control your lights, lock your front door, close your garage, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, in fact, there are over 10,000 skills developed by third parties. You can, Alexa will get you pizza, play games with you, like Jeopardy and, and others, check your bank account, get you coffee, and a whole lot of other things. In fact, these are some of the popular skills we have. You can get flowers for Mother's Day. Um, you can get a ride from Uber. Alexa, get me an Uber, and the Uber shows up. No more swiping, touching, working with apps anymore. Right, so that's the vision behind Alexa, uh, locking doors and so forth. So the, the way this is made possible is through a, a service we call the Alexa Skills Kit. So Alexa lives in the cloud, and you interact with Alexa through voice. Your interactions then get routed to these skills that then fulfill the request, and I'll show you how that works in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, so if you want to add a capability, your Domino's, you want to add pizza ordering capability, you build a skill for Alexa, you plug it in, and now millions of Alexa customers automatically have pizza ordering capability. We also have another service called the Alexa Voice Service that lets you embed Alexa in other devices. So of course you can get Alexa in things like this that Amazon makes, but you can also get Alexa in watches, in your car, in uh, video communicators, that's the bottom right, it's made by a company called Nucleus. Um, in the middle there, there's a kitchen uh, appliance, a kitchen device that Alexa enabled. So Alexa can actually live inside other devices as well. And at CES this year, there were dozens of devices like this um, uh, announced. So Samsung's going to have Alexa uh, enabled fridge. You can ask your fridge if, it's, if you're out of milk. And the fridge will talk back with you. So the idea is that any device can become an endpoint for Alexa. Um, and, and all these other kinds of examples, Dish Network, Another very big announcement. Uh, so we are running out of space for all of the partners that are incorporating or have incorporated Alexa, right? And so if you look at what people are doing with Alexa, a lot of uh, you know, the kinds of applications I, I showed you earlier. Uh, my favorite is actually the top right. Most Alexa devices are used by multiple people. This is really the first computer for years that is not a personal computer. It's a computer in your house. It's a, it's, a part, it's a friend. It's a member of your family. You talk to, talk to her. So this is where AI comes in, right? So we have this huge opportunity for AI. Imagine millions of people interacting with dozens of Alexa endpoints, interacting with tens of thousands of capabilities. It's a mind-boggling number of different use cases and types of conversational interactions. Everything has to be done through voice and through natural human conversation, right? So let's talk about why this is hard, right? Language understanding is the hardest problem we know. We have, we have self-driving cars, we have all kinds of fancy AI out there in the world. We don't have a computer that can speak like a five-year-old can to each other, just normal natural conversation, right? So why is language so hard? So let's look at some of the hard problems that we are solving with the, with the Alexa platform. Um, speech recognition is the most basic one. So you have Alexa sitting in a house, there's a party going on, there's music playing, the, your friends are talking, you say, Alexa. 
Alexa has to pick up your voice, zoom in, zero in, and pick up your speech sound and cancel everything else. Hard problem there. Okay. And now we have to figure out what the request is. So Alexa, you're in a party. Alexa, play some pink. What does that mean, play pink? Right? You're trying to play a piece of music by a band called capital P exclamation point NK. And Alexa has to figure that out and play it for you and, and get, get, the, get that thing right. Um, harder problems. Let's try this one. Alexa, who was the US president when Obama was a teenager? Anyone know the answer? Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford were the U.S. presidents when Barack Obama right. was a teenager. So we have to do inference to answer these questions. There is not a Wikipedia page you can look up which will tell you the four presidents during Ob Obama's teenage years. Right? So a lot of understanding has to be done to understand what you mean and then construct an answer for you. Why did you say it? If you say, Alexa, is it hot outside? Right? Um, the answer is no. But that's probably not what you intended. What you really meant was, what's the weather like? So your intent was to ask about the weather, but you didn't ask about the weather. And so we have to figure out what's in your head when you're asking that question, and then give you the right answer, which is something like it's now 42 or whatever it is outside in Mountain View. So that's basic speech interfaces. When you start getting into conversation, it gets even harder. Right? So let's talk about some of the challenges with, uh, with a conversation, Alexa, I want to see a movie. Now, Alexa has to talk back with you. What's the right response here? Right? Turn on Netflix on your television, find your movie nearby, playing at a theater, ask you what kind of genre of movie you want to see, ask you who you're watching a movie with so you can recommend something appropriate. There's a whole conversation you can have around that. So figuring out sort of why are you telling me this, why are you stating this, is a hard problem. We do it naturally with each other all the time. Context model modeling, right? What do we both already know that's in the context that we can refer to. To save time, I won't go through this, uh, this exercise. You can try it. So who is Barack Obama? Barack Obama is the whatever, right? Who is his wife? Where, where was she born? Or when was she born? She's a hard problem here, right? Figuring out who she refers to, because the user has never men mentioned Michelle Obama. And yet, it's, Alexa knows that you know that we're talking about Michelle. And so it's in the sh what we call the shared context of the conversation. So we have to maintain context and unpack that context as we go along, right? When was he born? Now we're back to Barack again. So here's another contextual problem. Alexa, what's 42? Anyone knows? Oh, so internet. 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <coughs> the trick is knowing what the question yeah. is. So this, this makes sense because we have a lot of shared context, cultural context, not dialogue context anymore, shared knowledge, and uh, you know, that we can riff off of when we talk with each other, and we'd like Alexa to do the same thing. And this question may not make sense if we're from different cultures and we don't have that shared understanding. Right, response generation, Alexa, I'm bored. Right, this is, this is one of the hardest problems. What is the right thing to, to say here? Right, so we tackle all of these kinds of problems on, in Alexa to give these millions of people on these d uh, d dozens of devices that magical experience of just speaking with Alexa just like with another human being. And that's the ultimate goal. Okay, so here's how Alexa works. So we say, uh, for example, Alexa, is it hot outside? We, the device is doing only one thing, which is listening for her name. Not doing any audio processing, no streaming. So we call that wake word detection. That's that uh, uh, sort of figuring out on the device that you're speaking to Alexa. After that, your voice gets sent up to the cloud. And it goes through speech recognition to figure out what the words are that you uttered based on the sound waves that came up. So in this case, it is, is it hot outside? We then go through natural language understanding to figure out your intent. In this case, it's the weather intent. We go through some processing to figure out the rest of the intent. You didn't ask where, I didn't, you t I didn't tell you where I wanted the weather. Maybe it's where I'm sitting right now. Maybe it's what I just said in my previous talk. I have to figure that out. And then finally I get an answer, and that gets spoken out in speech. And if this were a longer talk, I would show you some of the technologies behind each of these boxes. But folks here in the AI nano degree at Udacity, which is absolutely marvelous, you'll be learning to build every one of these boxes yourself, hands on. In the next six months or so, which is it? 
Okay, so I'll just conclude with uh, sort of how you use Alexa. I mentioned the skills kit if you're a software developer and you want to add capability. Uh, voice services if you're a hardware maker and you want your device to be uh, voice enabled. Uh, we also have the Alexa fund for startups if you had interesting ideas with voice. Uh, uh, Nucleus, the voice communicator, was a startup that we funded through the Alexa fund. Uh, and then final slide, uh, we have the Amazon Alexa prize for students. Uh, this is a two and a half million dollar competition to build a skill for Alexa that can converse engagingly and naturally with you about daily topics like politics, sports, entertainment, etc. Uh, there's a million dollar uh, challenge prize if you can uh, engage users for 20 minutes. And we have 18 teams from these colleges competing in it right now. In about a month, these, comp these uh, skills will be available for all of you to try. Love for you to try them, give the te teams feedback, and help them improve. Okay, so that's, my, that's the end. Um, so since we do have some students here, let me take five seconds to give you a piece of advice. If you do want to contact me, don't send me a generic one-click LinkedIn or to anybody else you want to contact. We get dozens of those. Take the trouble to write a short introduction so I know who you are, and I'd be happy to talk with you. Thanks very much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maureen Fan, CEO and co-founder at Baobab Studios. Wow, it's a great crowd. Hi, I'm Maureen Fan, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Baobab Studios. And before I start, I just want to see how many of you have seen the VR demo out there. Awesome. Everyone who hasn't, you should all go see it. Um, for th how many of you have tried out VR in your lives? Wow, that's a huge number. That's great for my industry. Okay, so I'm here to talk about VR and what it means to do interactive storytelling within VR. But before I do that, I want to show you a quick clip of the types of things that we can do in VR specifically for our company. This is called Invasion, and this is a short animated trailer of what it would be like to be in VR. Now imagine instead of this 2D screen here, you are on an icy lake and you look down, you have a little furry bunny body and you can hop around the ice and when you squat, your bunny body gets really fat just the way it would in real life if you were a bunny. Um, and imagine there's snow falling all around you and 
you can, uh, the bunny's actually coming up to sniff you and those aliens are about to attack you. And you notice that there are no cuts in there. And I'll explain more about that. But before I go there, I want to ask you guys, how many of you guys consider yourselves athletes? Okay, a few. <laughs> how about singer-songwriters? How about astronaut? Just one? Okay, one. <laughs> Always at least one person says yes. Okay, so if you're your five-year-old selves, you would have said yes to all the questions above. So the question is what happens from when you're five to becoming an adult that makes you a little bit less idealistic. Maybe someone told you your sculpture didn't look quite right in art class, or you had a tiger mom like I did, who told me I was totally too idealistic. But we believe in, inside everyone there is still a dreamer. And we know this to be true because it's why we go watch the movies, to experience characters and stories beyond those that we meet in our lives today. And we think animation does this way better than live action because while live action is still constrained by reality, Animation is constrained only by the creativity within the director's head, which is freedom. So animation is art in motion. It takes you to completely different worlds and makes it feel so real that you think you could reach out and touch it. And the last two sentences that I just said, which is takes you to a different world and makes it feel so real that you could touch it, is the definition of VR, which is why we think VR and animation were made for each other. So originally, Oh, the mission of our company, therefore, is to inspire you to dream, that bring that five-year-old in you back out, bring out your sense of wonder, and help you realize the potential that you have within you. Um, the company is, uh, we're called Beobov Studios. Um, the first one to tell you about my path really quick is to let you know that you don't have to know what you're doing in life, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> you don't have to have a set plan. I started off at eBay as a UI designer, ended up at Pixar on Toy Story 3, Ended up at Zynga, became vice president of games, looking over the Farmville franchise. And during that time, nights and weekends, I worked on a short animated film called The Dam Keeper, which got nominated for an Oscar. Basically, everything I did, I kept on taking night classes, anything that I really loved to get into the next career I wanted. So I didn't have Udacity back then, but I really wish I did. But I went the physical, concrete form and took community college classes. Eric Darnell was the director of Ants and also the writer and director of all four Madagascar films. He's my um, co-founder and chief creative officer. And there's Larry Cutler, who is a uh, uh, Pixar early days. He went to Stanford with me, master's thesis in VR, realized it was way too early in the 90s for VR, so was smart enough to go to Pixar and ended up at DreamWorks as global head of character technology and he's a judge for the Technical Achievement Awards. So the three of us got together and started this company a little over a year ago. So VR is very early, in its very early stages. And in terms of advisors, this is not just to brag about how awesome we are, but trying to explain to you how all the original people who did the transition from 2D to 3D are now interested in VR. Because to them, it feels the same as when 2D went to 3D. There's new technology, nobody knows what's going on, it's art and science put together. And so we have the co-founder of Pixar, the co-founder of PDI DreamWorks Animation, former CEO of Lucasfilm, uh, co-president of uh, DreamWorks, co-founder of Twitch, and my favorite who I worship is Glenn Keane, who was the main animator for Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Pocahontas, all the awesome Disney films, and also Chris Milk. So what is all the fuss about? Why do people like interactive storytelling and VR? Storytelling fundamentally is getting you all to feel empathy for characters. That's really what it's about. It's about making you care so much about a character that you want to see their story. You want to see do they win, do they fail, do they succeed. Now, our original main character was this little alien. But through VR, we realized that the bunny stole the show and it's specifically because of this moment. So she comes up and sniffs you, right? And then she gets on the ground and starts playing with you. And you're like, what's the big deal? It's called breaking the fourth wall in film. Like in Deadpool, you know how Deadpool looks at you and starts talking to you? But at no point in Deadpool did you really believe Deadpool is really talking to you. But in VR, something in your reptile brain makes you believe that Bunny's real and actually playing with you. So we had people start trying to pet her, coo at her, wave at her, and they started playing with her on the ground like a dog, and they were sure that she was reacting to them when she wasn't. It was totally canned animation. But at this point, we realized there was something very different about VR. 
Um, and then there's this other point where she runs behind you and hides behind you. And when the aliens come to shoot and point their lasers at you, Alvy Ray Smith, the co-founder of Pixar, he said, oh my God, I'm the only thing between these aliens and this bunny. I need to save her. I can feel her breath on my shoulder, which is really just the air conditioning from our office. But the point is, he's like, I have to save her. I love her. And at that point, we, found, we realized we won, right? In VR, we can make you care about that character so real that the stakes are so high that you want to protect her and actually take care of her. And that is the power of VR, something that you can never get in a 2D screen. So that's when we realized we were really onto something, and that was our first experiment to even see if we could do VR. And from that experience, we realized that Invasion became the top downloaded VR experience across all the, pl all the platforms. And this was really confusing to us because we thought VR was for hardcore gamers, right? It's just all about gaming. But for this to beat out all the hardcore games, we realized that it's not just about gaming, it's also about storytelling. So what is the future of VR? I don't know, but I can speculate. The truth is, think about how many years it took, decades it took for cinema to become what it is today. The cuts, pans, and zooms, and all that. That took a lot of experimentation, and that's the phase we're in right now. We're all about experimentation. So for any of you, it's great news for you all, because um, what I'm basically saying is to ignore everything I'm telling you. Ignore everything that everyone's telling you, throw the rule books out and experiment and try things that are new because that's the only way we're going to figure out what the actual language of VR is. And I want to show you a quick clip of something that we premiered at Sundance Film <laughs> Festival. <laughs> So this is the second episode since Invasion did so well, uh, Roth Kirschenbaum films. Roth is the former chairman of Disney. He did Maleficent, Snow White and the Huntsman, Alice in Wonderland. They picked it up to become a feature, Invasion to become a Hollywood feature film, which is amazing because usually it's Hollywood stuffing their IP into the new tech rather than the other way around. So we're really excited. This is episode two. But one thing we did realize with this is we can make you not only a bunny, but a character that can actually walk around within the space and have em not only care about the characters, but act upon that caring, which we call compassion. And so now, not only can you care, you can actually interact with the characters, help them, hurt them, do many different things with the characters, which makes the stakes even higher. And we think that's the next evolution of storytelling. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to Follow us on any of these things or email me at maureen at baobabstudios.com and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. And if you guys haven't checked out the VR thing, you should definitely do it. So once again, there are a few seats over here, so feel free to sit down, because I promise the last session is going to be pretty much amazing. Largely not because every session has been amazing, but because these are two individuals that are truly the dreamers, the forward thinkers, and the innovators that we all talked about today. So give it up for Astro Teller from X and Sebastian Thrun. Hi again. <laughs> Hi again. Hi, Hi Sebastian <laughs> Astro. It's my unbelievable pleasure, honor, privilege to present my best friend, long-term friend, Astro Teller, <coughs> uh, grandson of infinitely many noble lords <laughs> of similar names, head of Google X, now X Labs, um, and general genius and wonderful human being to you. Some of you might know him, but welcome. Thank you very much. My very first question I can't help is, 
What's this with this jacket? Uh, this is just what I put on <laughs> this morning. <laughs> but in fact, I got this jacket. I think someone was trying to prank me. They gave me this jacket and a, a man named Craig Barrett, who at the time also worked at Alphabet, a matching jacket. It wasn't an R2-D2 jacket, it was a Wookiee jacket. Uh, so it had like the bandolier across here and like the, you pull up the hood and it was all fuzzy. And he just said, no way, I'm not wearing that. Because <laughs> we were gonna spend a day emceeing an event kind of like this together. Then he didn't wear it and I just thought, eh, you know, that's a little bit lame. I, I'm gonna wear my R2-D2 jacket. So even though, I mean, I'm into Star Wars, but I'm not super into Star Wars. But so I wore it for the day, just it's for great. fun, I don't know. And then I got into it. I'm, just enjoying being a robot, I guess. Are you guys hiring robots? Just kidding. <laughs> but you just joined us as a hiring partner. Yes, we did. That is great. So, <laughs> I think shortly after I got fired, I think this became the best place to work in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a total coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so what are you hiring? Um, well, we hired lots of things. We're certainly hiring roboticists. We care a lot about machine learning. Uh, a lot of the work that we do at X is systems integration work. We don't do a lot of basic science, essentially, but we work on problems that haven't been solved before. And so a lot of that turns out to be complex, iterative system uh, integration kind of work, taking pieces that already exist in the world, sometimes that ha custom versions of them have to be made, and putting them together in unusual ways, getting it out in the world, trying, you've discovered that you're wrong, and you make a new design and you repeat, is the sort of general way that it feels, I think, for all of the X projects. So people who are good at that. I want to I wanna, I wanna <coughs> take you 50 years in the future. Tell me what's going to be interesting. Awesome. Let's go. <laughs> I don't want to wait this long. What's going to be interesting in 50 years? I, 30 I, years? I think the world is going to be almost unrecognizable in 20. So is this good I, or bad? I'm sure it'll be a mix. I think mainly it'll be um, a pretty exciting and mostly positive place. I'm sure it's going to be disorienting getting there, though. So you're not talking about a nuclear winter or something? No, no, no. I, I think that the world is going to turn out to surprise us more positively than negatively. But the world is going to be incredibly different in 20 years. The saying is, and I think that this is correct, that people tend to overestimate the progress of technology and the rate of change in the short term, that is, Three years from now, they think the world will be more different than it is, and they underestimate it in the medium term. Over 10 to 20 years, I think we all collectively can't really imagine how different it will be. My rule of thumb would be 20 years from now ought to be roughly like 100 years in the past. So if you can imagine the last 100 years of change in the next 20, I think that that's probably a realistic estimate for how different the world will feel. Wow, that means people have to learn a lot <laughs> along the way. Yes, I think our society is not yet wired for the rate of change that we're going to be experiencing. One thing that always impresses me on you is, is your attitude towards innovation and specifically things like fear and failure and so on. You, s you celebrate when you fire people or when projects fail, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure we would celebrate letting someone go. Um, though sometimes it is the case that we help people to go to a place that is better for them and <laughs> I have, at least on occasion, had them... You liberate them. Yes, absolutely. It is sometimes the case that, you know, Susie can be great somewhere, but the place she currently is is not where she can be great. And it is a favor to Susie's team and to myself, but also to Susie to tell that to Susie. Certainly not telling her that and letting her just suffer indefinitely being not excellent when she has the capacity to be excellent is not doing anybody, particularly Susie, a favor. We're doing this, by the way, with all our students. We call You're liberating all of them? We, we graduate them. <laughs> yes, well, I do the same thing <laughs> with our projects. Yeah. Yes. Stanford does it, I remember. <laughs> we, we, we have these wonderful, pompous moments yes. when we kick out every student. <laughs> 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 and the parents come to celebrate with them about this. <laughs> it's really true. <laughs> That's why we call it graduation for the projects at X. So instead of feeling like they're being kicked out of Eden, they feel a little bit more like they're leaving home and going to college, hopefully. <laughs> I, I had Steve Blank here before, and I asked him this one question. And I want to ask you the same question. Um, 
I want you to go back to your 18 years, 18 years old self mm -hmm. when you're just entering college. What advice would you give yourself? You know, one of the things that I think about frequently, if I could go back and change something, it was a little moment, but it's become actually bigger for me over time instead of smaller. I was a junior, so maybe 19, 20, something like 20 years old probably, at Stanford. And my brother had just gotten to Stanford. He was a freshman. He was doing an undergraduate degree in physics, but he was spending actually more of his time doing acting, being a thespian, than <laughs> being, doing his physics degree. And I was getting to know his mentor, whose name was Winter Mead. And after one of the shows, Winter came up to me and he said, you'd be great in the theater. You should really join the company and do something. And I said, oh no, I'm really busy. I, I had some set of excuses, and I was really busy. That's not why I said no. I was afraid. I just, I don't know. I think it was probably because it was important to me. And I've regretted that ever since. Not because I want to be in the theater. It just bothers me. It's one of the few things in my life I didn't do because I was afraid, and I know I didn't do it because I was afraid. And I've thought ever since, I'm not doing that. I can fail for all kinds of reasons, but I'm not going to fail again because I was just too afraid to try. So now when you're afraid, you do it? Yeah, I am actually counterphobic in How that sense. How can you drive a car? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to drive okay, a car. I'm not afraid to run a red light. <laughs> <laughs> You've done an unbelievably amazing job as the Q of Silicon Valley, um, the magician who puts balloon into the stratosphere build self-driving cars and whatever it is that you've been doing in, in X. What is your recipe Thank you. to, um, and, and, and maybe I take a tiny bit of credit as well, but what's your recipe, <laughs> no, that's not true, to, <laughs> as, as this organization evolves and matures and, and, and quite frankly, it gets larger in size, to keep it fresh? How do you keep like the innovative genes going? I think a lot about all of the tensions that we have at X. And some of the tensions are fairly straightforward, some of them less straightforward. But for example, we have to have raging optimism or we would never try the things that we try. But if you just empower people to have raging optimism, go forth, be crazy. The crazier the better without limit. You are not gonna get good results. So there has to be a kind of scathing paranoia and skepticism that balances out that optimism. You have to keep those in balance if you're actually gonna get what you want. But that's not the only kind of tension that we have. Another one is the, you know, what you could say positively would be the support structures at X, or if you wanna be negative about it, the bureaucracy at X. So we want to bring to bear on projects the right help at the right time, to amplify them or to help you know, move them onto a better path when they're sort of veering off of the path. In the best case scenarios, that's wonderful, of course, it sounds really positive the way I just said that, but if it's done wrong, it sure feels like bureaucracy to the project leads, and they sometimes express that to me, and a, a bureaucracy is the last thing that I want to produce. So that's another example where having no structure doesn't make any sense. Then we're just a venture capitalist. We're just giving people money and walking away. That's, that right. doesn't make sense for us to do that. But if we smother them with attention, if I think that I know how to do their job better than them, one of us is redundant. Like, that's a bad plan. So getting that light touch is another example where it's not, both ends of the spectrum are bad and there's somewhere in the middle that's right and we're always sort of searching for it. Many of our students and partners came from, I think, over 20 countries, which is amazing, including places as far away as Jordan and Estonia. Um, what is the magic of Silicon Valley? And what can you take home to different countries? There's something in the water here that's certainly palpable, I think, for the people so who the live water here. Home. Take, <laughs> I'm not actually <laughs> suggesting taking the water home. You know, what... One of the ways that is not my favorite phraseology, but I've heard it frequently, is a culture of creative destruction. Uh, and so that's not what I would take home, but I think that that's what you might hear frequently. Uh, one of the ways I might prefer it would be a healthy embrace of failure. So someone was just uh, asking me, it was a Korean newspaper, was asking me how can uh, 
that the companies in Korea do better. They feel really afraid to take risks because they might look bad. And I don't know if this is true, but this was a suggestion I gave yesterday morning to this reporter to take back to companies in Korea, which was, it's not that we want to look bad in Silicon Valley. I don't think that's it at all. But I'm willing to look arbitrarily stupid right now if that's what it takes to win in the long run. I think it's a time horizon difference. If you understand and can connect that being open to being wrong now is the essence of learning and that learning is the superpower that causes you to win, then you become hungry to be wrong and to start over and to try new things now, no matter how imperfect it makes you look in the short term, because your time horizon on which you're unwilling to lose is very long. And so I think even though there is a culture of speed in Silicon Valley, I believe that the length of the time horizon over which people are trying to optimize themselves being longer may actually be part of the secret sauce. We have microphones, and I want to open up uh, for audience question in a minute. Uh, so if you want to line up between <coughs> these two microphones, please, as usual. Uh, but I have one question while you're lining up. Tell us about your son. <laughs> um, well, so he's referring to the fact that my son uh, finished his first nano degree a little over a year ago. His name is Griffin Teller, and he did the Introduction to Computer Science. He really enjoyed it. He was... Um, just turned 12 when he finished it, and he's struggling his way, working hard, I don't know if struggling might not be fair even, through the machine learning course. And I just, Sebastian, I told Sebastian this over dinner last week, and he said, oh, that's actually one of the really hard courses. And I went home and I said, you know, Griffin, you're going pretty slowly through it. Sebastian says, that's one of the really hard ones. Do you want to ask for help? Do you want to switch to one that's easier? And he's like, no, no, I got it. So I just, it's, I have to like go back and like learn a whole bunch of extra math every time I get to the next phase. <laughs> <laughs> he's 13 now. So, um, but I'm very, very grateful to Udacity because Griffin's a bright boy and he's hardworking and he's focused. But that by itself, I was just saying back in the green room, wouldn't actually have translated to something like this. I don't think it's an accident that he's not doing chemistry or physics or history. There isn't a platform for supporting him doing that, and Udacity has actually provided him with just the right kind of structure, so he has to work hard, he can self-pace his learning. It means a huge amount to him. You it's actually part of why I'm here today. We have, we have over <laughs> 20 recruiters outside. And I think you should bring him here and have a talk with him. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be tuition back. <laughs> uh, let's start in the center. Okay. Um, hello, Dr. Teller. Um, could you sh perhaps share a little bit about um, the use of reinforcement learning in hedge funds, perhaps? Reinforcement learning in which domain? In hedge funds or financial. Hedge funds. <laughs> um, I'm not sure reinforcement learning is only issue, let me answer the question slightly more generally, mm -hmm. the time, I believe, where the application of machine learning in many domains mm -hmm. to the individual problems as posed by humans is ending. It'll go away over, you know, 10 or 20 years. It won't happen overnight. The thing which is starting to be the case, and one of the areas in which you can see this happening is hedge funds, mm -hmm. is where the questions themselves are being asked by machine learning. Now, it often won't look like, and, and machine learning being you know, deep nets and reinforcement learning and a number of other tools, it sometimes won't look like the question is being asked, but when you do end-to-end -end learning of any kind in any domain, you are essentially leaving up to the system that's doing the learning more of the decomposition of the problem to the computer, to the, the learning system, that that's part of the task, the featureizing of the data, the decomposition of the problem. That's what humans used to do. And so I think that movement is something we're going to see a lot more of. At computers essentially starting to ask the questions and structure the problem as well as actually solving the problem. And hedge funds is definitely one of the areas in which that's happening. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Would you summarize your view of failure, uh, on failure as fail fast? 
learn faster? Yeah, I mean, fail fast is lip service, which is thrown around very liberally all around the valley and other places. And I think it largely does not get people what they want. And so there's nothing wrong with the term fail fast, but that and $1.50 will get you on the bus. The problem is that there's <laughs> the lip service of whatever you say, like fail fast, and then there's the actual way that people behave. And the reason that those pointers are so different is because these are the emotional paths of least resistance in your organization. And you can say fail fast until the cows come home, but if you punish people, in fact, if you do anything short of actively rewarding them when they fail, it doesn't matter that you say fail fast. So what do you mean when you say fail fast? And so we have mechanisms at X to reward people when they stand up and they say, that was a worthwhile experiment we just ran, and the result of the experiment is the null hypothesis, i.e., we shouldn't keep doing that. Great, let's go on to the next one. You reward them in that moment. You don't punish them for admitting that the result of the experiment was the null hypothesis. That's often the answer when you run an experiment. But that's not how most corporations work. That's not how people feel when they go to work in the morning. They want to get an attaboy from their peers. They want to get an attaboy from their manager. If they can't get one by saying, my thing didn't work, they will not say, my thing did not work. Hey, uh, Dr. Teller. So great uh, talk. So I had a question. So does moonshots work on problems like starvation and hunger? I mean, can we ever solve real problems today with technology? Like starvation and hunger as an example. So. Sure. Um, I, I don't have a ready solution for starvation and hunger, but I don't think that any problem is immune to moonshot thinking. So at least the way we would define it in X, a moonshot has three basic components. There has to be a huge problem with the world that you can name and you want to address. You have just named a huge problem in the world. The second is you have to have a radical proposed solution to that problem. Not radical because you want to be cool and get cool points in the world for having been weird, but in the spirit of trying to go to a new place, to try something that people haven't tried, to not just be in a smartness contest with everyone else who's tried to address the problem, but to be in more of a bravery and creativity contest with the problem itself. So that's the second thing, having a radical proposed solution. And then the third, at least as we would define it, but I suppose there are other ways of addressing problems, but at X, we would say that the third problem, the third aspect that you have to bring in order for it to be a moonshot is you have to present some kind of breakthrough technology or proposed set of technologies which brought together would be a breakthrough that would enable this science fiction sounding product or service that would solve that problem. Put in that way, there's no reason that you couldn't solve starvation and hunger using those tools um, and I hope you do. <laughs> Thank you. So you just described some of the criteria for what makes a good project, but where do the projects come from originally, and how do you go through vetting them and, and forming like a, a more long-term project? So I could imagine other ways of doing it, but roughly the way it feels at X is there's a huge pile of ideas on the metaphoric table. Anyone can put them on the table. And by the way, we have a mechanism where you guys can submit on our website Moonshot Ideas 2X, and we're very happy to take them from any and all places. Because we believe that ideas by themselves, raw technologies by themselves, are worth something, but they don't reliably turn into something great. That the work that's really special happens primarily after the idea. So we have this huge pile of ideas on the table. There isn't an actual table, right? And then a lot of the fail fast, a lot of the work is how do you pick through all of these things on the table and throw them away as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, but for good reasons, not for fake reasons. If you're like, oh, I don't like that one, it's easy to take it off the table, but you haven't actually added any value. That's not a good reason. If you pick one off the table and you say, hey, look, this one breaks the second law of thermodynamics, I think we can throw that one away without further discussion. Oh, look, this one is made of unobtainium, right? So we can throw that one away. Sadly, not all of them can be removed from the table as 
easily as those, and so you often have to do real work. Sometimes you have to build prototypes, you have to talk to the people who, who act in that ecosystem and say, if we built this thing, would it solve the problem? And then they say, hmm, not really. And you say, well, that's good to know. Thank goodness we didn't spend a huge amount of time and money building the thing, only to discover at the end that that wasn't really going to solve the problem in the world. Um, so that is one of the main muscles at X, is how do you get people both to feel good about throwing stuff onto the table and feel good about taking it back off the table. And the best case scenario, which has happened a few times at X, is when the both happen in the same meeting. When someone gets a brownie point from me or from others for having brought up a beautiful idea and in the same meeting helps us throw the idea away, and gets two pieces of brownie point, that's failing fast. When they feel like they got brownie points for putting it on the table and taking it off in a half an hour meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about to pass this question, but then when you said that, don't regret it tomorrow, that's why I came in here. Good. <laughs> so both of you are uh, people who have created the kind of impact which everyone here wants to create in their lives. Um, but my question is that, uh, suppose you have a person like me, I have figured out that this is my passion, this is the problem I want to solve, but along the side, I need to stay relevant, I need to know the current affairs, I need to know, like read TechCrunch, Wired, Business Insider, there are like so many resources and all of them creating so much new information every day <laughs> that if I spend time reading those, I won't solve my problem. <laughs> I won't be doing my job. So my question to you is, along with following your passion, how do you spend your time and keep yourself updated? So what do you read? both of these answers will be probably popular with you guys, but not popular with much of the rest of the world. But I feel pretty strongly about both of them. The first one is, I got lucky. Um, I won't speak for Sebastian, but <laughs> I got lucky. Um, and I, I hope that you guys are calibrated on that, that the people who are the most successful usually worked fairly hard and they have some skill, so it wasn't entirely luck, but do not believe that there is not a huge amount of luck involved or hold yourself to a standard as though there were not a huge amount of luck involved. It will drive you crazy totally unfairly. The second thing is, I don't read business books. Actually, mostly, I read The Economist every week. Um, but I mostly don't even read the news, especially now, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know what I spend time doing? I talk to people, and I really listen to them. The things that I was describing about how X is set up, that's not taken from some great business book I read. I'm actually managing people, and I'm really paying attention to what moves their needle. It's like this observation is just watching people and saying like, oh, I told you to do that, and you're doing this. Why are you doing that? You just go ask them. I have behaviors that you won't read about in a business book, but I didn't get them from a business book or any collection of them. For example, here's one of my mantras, if you come into my office and you tell me I'm an idiot, I will say the first words out of my mouth will absolutely be thank you, and very likely I will come around the table and give you a hug. Because if you don't do that, that will be the last time that person ever says anything hard to you, and probably the last time anyone in the organization ever says anything hard and therefore important for you to know to you. But that's an observation about humans and like what, how they operate. So I strongly believe that there's a ton that can be learned from working hard, being open to the fact that you're wrong a lot of the time, because we're all wrong a lot of the time, and really listening to the people around you. They have a lot to teach you. So that doesn't mean never read any books, but I think that the idea that you can somehow program yourself by cleverly picking the 1% of the fire hose of data that's coming at you and only listening to that 1% is a bit of a fantasy. Thank you. 
Yeah, my question is a little bit in line with that. So that's a fireside chat, so personal questions are okay, I think. <laughs> so obviously um, you are a huge inspiration and uh, very successful in what you are doing. Is there anything you had to stop doing or anything you had to sacrifice during, during that time? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly had to sacrifice a lot of things, but a few of them that have been particularly hard for me, for example, I'm a people pleaser. I like to resolve conflict, and I physically feel, I don't know, sick might be a, an exaggeration, but uncomfortable when people around me fight. Even if they work for me, I feel bad about it. Obviously, that's totally dysfunctional for me to be running an organization when I can't be direct and have conflict with people. It's really important that I be able to do that. So that's an example of something that I have learned how to do and I have mantras and structures for emotional structures that to get me to do it um, and to do it quickly, in fact. But it still doesn't feel very good when I do it. And that's the sort of thing I kind of wish I didn't. I'm a card carrying nerd and and yet I don't actually spend very much of my time on those things. That's another sacrifice. I want to end up actually tinkering and like thinking some of the new stuff. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to like actually run one of the projects at X. There's a real sense in which I actually don't want the job that I have. The reason that I'm doing it is because I believe that I'm nurturing this group of people and making something possible that wouldn't be possible otherwise, and that gives me a real sense of purpose, even though on a day-to-day -day basis, it's kind of not what would be most fun for me. So that's another example. Thank you. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Astra. Uh, I'm curious to, if you guys think that there's like opportunity to create a startup around like, uh, a, like a dating application that uses machine learning and AI because we all know divorce is like a giant problem in <laughs> our country. <laughs> but like, maybe that uses like Google Glass or something to create per perfect matches. Or do you think like there's I'm not totally enough I'm totally letting like, Sebastian take this one. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Build it. <laughs> so do you think like a start there could be like a startup like kind of like Tinder that uses mo machine learning and AI to create like perfect re relationships so you can avoid divorce in the future? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so let me let me let me answer this a bit differently. <laughs> the number of emails I get for whatever stupid reason, mostly from Germans, turns out, because it was on German television and some futuristic show, of people who have built contraptions that solve climate change and make clocks go backwards is huge. And <laughs> sometimes it drives me nuts to see that people like, spend so much time inventing things. I look at them and say, why? Um, maybe, I mean, fixing divorces is a good thing, but what I often find is that people are taken by a technical idea. They, they find, oh my, what if I, let's say combine, I'm going to pull, you know, if, you, if you allow me to, say, say Tinder with machine learning. It's a technical idea. But for me, the first step is always to think about the problem. So give you an example. Um, I have a lot of robotics colleagues, some very prominent ones are in the room here. And any robotics professor, takes as a dogma that all problems in the world are solved by robots, <laughs> right? So you'd go, for example, and would say, um, I build humanoid robots, and what can they do? Well, how about elderly care? All of Japanese robotics, so half Japanese robotics does this, like they, they have done it for 20 years, put a humanoid robots, because since they're building a humanoid, this must, must be useful, right? And it must be useful for something, it's useful for everything. Uh, let me find the most useful thing, it's elderly care. And then come down to me and say, hey, what do you think about if I start a company on robots for elderly care that have two legs? And then I often say, that sounds great. Let's do one little excursion, okay? Suppose you want to solve the elderly care project, project, problem, the ones you want to solve, whatever that one is. Let's think what's the best solution for that problem. And if it still involves a robot, then start your company. All right, so... Suppose you want to solve the divorce problem in this country. You really want to solve it. They want fewer divorces, say, for whatever reason. Then 
let's figure out what is the best solution to this problem. And if you come up and think it's machine learning on Tinder, then <laughs> build it. <laughs> anyway. I think that's a fine answer. I would also say that um, you know, machine learning and Tinder might not make our, our list at X, but the general answer at X <laughs> would be how fast, how long does it take for you to think about it and talk to people, and how long does it take for you to make a prototype of it? Because if you can make a prototype of it really fast, the right answer might be, don't worry about it. Just like make it and try it. Uh, you'd be amazed what making it and trying it, like maybe it's going to go supernova and you don't have to have these arguments with idiots who don't understand it like us. Or maybe it turns out that it's actually not a good idea and then that'll be the fastest way to discover that it's not a good idea. So that's not always the right thing to do. But that one sounds like you could prototype something so fast that it might actually be faster to just make it instead of trying to figure out whether you're right or not. Thanks. I'm fortunately, really unfortunately, mm -hmm. out of time. Uh, we have a few seconds left. Astro, it's right. been Sebastian, great. thank you. <laughs> I want to end um, by saying that... Um, Don't listen. <laughs> that's so funny. That's exactly what I was going to say. So when I started at X a long time ago, I reported to uh, Sebastian, and he gave me, so he was my manager, and I really admire you, Sebastian, uh, and I just want to leave these guys with something that I think about, and I know you said it tongue-in-cheek, and I'm going to say it partly to tease you, but I also mean it sincerely to them, and I know you meant it sincerely to, to me. The first and only really sincere feedback that Sebastian ever gave me as my manager was, don't listen to your manager. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and you were good at it. <laughs> and <laughs> you were good at it. <laughs> and, and, and ironically, that was such important uh, feedback for me that uh, it's really stuck with me, and it's part of why I admire you. Thank you for being <laughs> you. a guide for me wait, and for all of us. My, my manager <laughs> sits over there, and I can see how it's cringing because <laughs> it's exactly what I do. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> Thank you. Astro and Sebastian, you always know how to end the day on a high note. So we put together a video of the entire day, so we're going to roll it for you. So roll video.